Someone else? 403? Correct. Four eleven from the choir. Four eleven. Three twenty six and what we know? Four hundred. Four hundred. Three twenty six. Three twenty seven. Going once. And then four
Four one. wonder why very often in hymns the, the number 10,000 comes up. And in scripture, 10,000 was always a reference to God. You remember David and Saul? And there was one time when David and Saul were making the transition from Saul to David. And people were saying, Saul has killed his thousands, but David has killed his 10,000. That meant that David was the favorite one by God at this time. So just remember that. 10,000 always refers to God or something that God has done. And the people said, Amen. I love doing that. I knew that you were coming here to make an announcement. So I'll greet the people in the name of Christ. I'll greet the people and say you are the body of Christ. Listen attentively to what my colleague is about to share. I'm Peter Gray, the Minister of Visitation and the Coordinator of Stephen Ministries. Not necessarily in that order. But I'm going to have Eric Steva show us a video this morning of someone who had gone through the process of meeting with a Stephen minister. And this is her testimony. As a single person of it. Throughout my entire pregnancy, at least, at least once a week she met with me, and she lived clear on the other side of town, and she was also a teacher by trade for special education, and sometimes it was a little uncomfortable for me um, because it was, it was so one-sided. She just sat there, and, you know, just for minutes and minutes on end listening to me, and I would say, okay, I need you to, what's going on? What can I pray for you about? And she's like, Michelle, this is your time. Just enjoy it. This is your time. She goes, I'm covered. We're good. She says, keep talking. You know, let's, this is about you. And I've always been the person that people came to, you know, to help them. So that was something new for me. My Stephen minister, I'm sure everybody says this, but she's amazing. The day that I delivered Preston, I remember going to, 
going into the doctor's office and found out I had been in labor for two days and didn't realize it. And they said, do you have your bag with you? I said, no. Well, can you get your bag? Well, I think so. And I called her up. I said, um, I know it's a school day and you're probably in class, but what am I going to do? She goes, don't worry about it. I'm on my way. And she tells her the story after the fact that she ran to the principal's office and said, I told you this day was coming. She needs me and I'm gone. And do you know that she brought me my bag? I mean, she was the first person there before my family even got there. And it's just an amazing experience. Being a care receiver, actually, I think was a stepping stone for truly getting me plugged into my church. Um, I ended up being more comfortable with sharing my story or maybe tidbits of my story. Um, I became comfortable of reaching out to those around me when I needed some help. And I feel like I'm at home now. Um, I truly feel like I belong to a family at my church and it was the Stephen Ministry experience that introduced that. Hi, buddy. Are you saying cheese? Say cheese. Say hi, Oma. Hello, Oma. Say I love you, Oma. Say I love you, Papa. Papa. Yeah, say bye-bye. Bye. Mwah, -bye. no kiss. After church, you're all invited to a special information time about Stephen Ministries. Come whether you want to become a Stephen Minister or not, we have some handouts for you. Oh, thank you, Peter. Apparently, I've become one of them because my heart now is more tenderized when I see little ones like that toddling along. I've become one of them. Welcome again to those of you who are here. Welcome to those who are visiting with us and part of us in the live streaming web community. We are the body of Christ. I say that week in and week out. It is literally true. And I am so pleased that you are with us. I invite you to take a deep breath. Ruach, wind, breath, spirit. Be prepared to worship God. And in preparation of that, I invite you who are able and for whom it's comfortable to stand with me that we might in fact and indeed share the call to worship. It is an adaptation of Psalm 77. I will call to mind the deeds of the Lord. I will meditate on all your work and muse on your mighty deeds. Your way, O oh God, is holy. With a strong arm, you redeem your people.
our shared voices in the unison prayer of invocation found in our bulletin, one heart, one soul, one voice, let us say together, God, you have called us here to face into your gracious way of living. You invite to leave the past behind us and to walk into these new days of our ministries. Sometimes, oh God, we'd rather remember how things used to be. Sometimes we are afraid to be disciples. Yet discerning now your presence amongst us, we acknowledge that this is a new day and that you, O oh God, are sharing your freedom with us. Today is a day to put aside all fear, to leave doubting behind, and to take courage in your loving call. My friends, please be seated, and all children who are part of our church school, please join me up front here. All right, excellent. Dylan, I would love your help up here too. Come on up. Okay, good, 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 good. Oh, this is great. Lovely, lovely, lovely. Thank you for coming up. I appreciate it. Thank you for being here. I would love you. Oh, yes. Sure, Rachel. Come on. Come on. I have something in this cup, and I would love all of you to take one of what's in here. Good. And in this cup is something for each of you, and you can, of course, take it with you after you're done, and when you go back down to your class. Yeah, you can take one, too. No, please, it's important. There you go. Oh, good, thank you so much. Yeah, take one. Excellent. Now, everyone out there is wondering what in the world is going on. But we'll just take this time. Oh, you get one too, sure, absolutely. Okay, what all of them have in their hands. Now, what does this do? What is the job of what you have in your hand? Yeah. It puts things together. Yeah, right. It holds things together, right? So you would think that anything that holds things together would look all the same. So I want you to look at one another's. Look, look at yours and then look at the one that's right next to you and tell me a little bit about what they look like. Um, what, 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 does, what does yours look like, Dylan? Two rectangles. Two, two rectangles. What do you commonly call it? Clothespin. Right. It holds things together. Good. Yeah? Okay. And Brent, what, what, tell me about what what do you have? A bendy wire. And what, what is it, what, how you would describe it? What color is it? Oh, gave yours away. She took it, all right, good. Stripey, what color is stripey? Okay, black and white stripey, all those with black and white stripies, show me your hand, like black and, no, wait a second. No black and white stripies. Okay, well we'll just keep going. How about you, what, how would you describe yours? Yellow, and what's it made of? Metal, and is it, does it look, mine's yellow too, does it look anything like this? No, well wait a second, we're both yellow, right? Hmm. But yours looks different than mine. But it holds things together. Okay, here you go. No matter what colors yours are, no matter what color yours is, no matter what shape you have, no matter that it looks differently than anybody else's, the fact is that all of what you have all hold things together. 
And my point here for you is that that's just like families. Just like families. No matter what color those families are, no matter what shape those families take, families are one of the best things that hold us all together. So some of our families look really different than some other families, and it's like our clips. All of our families, no matter what their color, no matter what their shape, no matter what their big word here, configuration, all families that are loving one another all do the same thing. They hold us together. So I want you to take your clip, no matter what it looks like, and I would like you to keep it. I'd like you to bring it to class. I'd like you to bring it home. And every time you see it, I want you to think of God's love, and I want you to think of how families hold it all together. OK? On down to summer Sunday school.
Good morning. Today I will be reading from Luke 9, verses 51 through 62. They can be found on page 57 in the New Testament in your pew Bible. There's a deep understanding of forgiveness in these verses that I'm going to read to you. <clears throat> these verses reflect on how one Samaritan village the people refuse to see Jesus, and yet in another village, three people wanted to follow Jesus. <clears throat> the exact location of these villages are unknown. Samaria was a, in an area north of Jerusalem, and the Jews and the Samaritans did not, they didn't distrust, they distrusted each other. And so the Samaritans had their own temple, their own priest, and they uh, worship the law of Moses in a different way. This reading is from the Essential Study Bible. Not long before it was time for Jesus to be taken up to heaven, he made up his mind to go to Jerusalem. So Jesus sent some messengers ahead to the village to get the way prepared for him when he went to visit. But Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem, so the people there did not receive him, and they didn't welcome him. When the disciples James and John saw this happen, they said, Lord, do you want us to ask fire to come down from heaven to burn these people up? But Jesus turned and rebuked them and said, for the Son of Man has not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them only, and they went on to another village. And it came to pass as they went on their way, a certain man approached Jesus and said, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus replied, foxes have dens, and birds have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. And Jesus said to another man, come, follow me. But he said, Lord, let me wait until I bury my father. And Jesus said to him, let the dead bury the dead, and you go and talk about God's kingdom. Then someone said to Jesus, I want to follow you, but first let me go back and take care of things at home. Jesus' reply to that was, anyone who starts plowing is, and keeps looking back isn't worth a thing to God's kingdom. May God bless this reading. There are some people that can get away with certain things. And Faith, I loved it when you got to the part of, and Jesus rebuked them. And what you did harkened back to my little boy days, because what you did was, and Jesus rebuked him. You gave, you gave me the mother finger. <laughs> oh, that's great. Thank you for that. <laughs> Uh, so, back in January, when the 113th Congress took their seats, they became the most ecumenical gathering of that body since the very beginning. It included the first Buddhist to serve in the Senate, the first Hindu to serve in either chamber, the first to officially and publicly describe her affiliation as none. And I don't mean with a habit and stuff. I mean, zero, none. Ten other members of the 113th Congress did not specify a religious affiliation, and that's up from six members of the previous Congress. Religion-wise, those ten plus one who said none all fall in a category demographers label as nuns. 
The Pew Forum, which is the people who research these kinds of things, track these kinds of things, says that for the most part, the religious diversity of Congress roughly mirrors the trends in our country as a whole. The congressional nuns, however, are an exception. They comprise a lower 2% of all of Congress. And that's low. Compared to the general population, the religiously unaffiliated, lumped with non-believers, comprise about 20%, one out of every five. So, as a category, nuns can be further and more properly divided into nuns and nons. That is to say, the division of nuns we are those who have not given up on faith, but have given up perhaps on organized religion coming to places like this. More than three quarters of all of those nuns are like that. The nons, however, those who self-identify as atheist or agnostic, are a very small part of that. So I hope that's not confusing. Anyway, it's a significant kind of thing that the Pew Research folk have, have begun to look at in our country and in our government. So, both the nuns and the nons are concerning um, for the church. Those are some things that we want to pay attention to. But our text today that Faith shared with us brings another group into our awareness, and we might want to pay attention to that as well. It's not one that the pew tracks very much. It is the butts. I'm not going to go where some of you just went, but <laughs> actually the lectionary reading contains two incidences and Faith was good at pointing those out. The first one is the refusal of the Samaritans, that Samaritan village, to receive Jesus, right? Didn't, didn't do that well. There was that competition, well, well spoken. There was that competition and the Samaritan, that first village, didn't receive Jesus. <laughs> and one of the disciples want to rain down fire. And Jesus rebuked them. Huh? They, uh, they were nuns, right? I'm sorry, they were nons. They were non-faithful uh, in that sense. People in the second story, that second part of it, quite ready to believe, however. They were quite ready to believe. And when Jesus said, follow me, they, they heard that. They had some other things they wanted to take care of first, which then meant that Jesus' invitation was of secondary importance. Sure, Jesus, I'll follow you, you but first let me bury my father. Absolutely, Jesus, I'm with you, you but first. Let me say farewell to those at home. On the surface of it, those requests seem eminently reasonable. Although in the case of these invitees, I have to wonder whether they're going out on the road listening to Jesus, and in the first case, his father is dead, his father just died, and he's out there on the road listening to Jesus. Something else is going on here, I suspect that these responses are actually excuses. The kind of excuses that sometimes, I don't know about you, sometimes I find myself saying, when I'm trying to go back on something, like, oh, I don't know, a, a sales relationship, right? Someone's trying to sell me something that I've even expressed an interest in. But then they told me the price of it. As the salesperson presses me, I begin to hear myself mumble something like, well, I'm not quite ready to buy, or I say something like, but first, I need to check with Karen. <laughs> or maybe I'll be back to hear more, but first, I have these other things that I have to take care of. Now, in the case of our scripture, Jesus come back to the would-be followers in the text seems harsh to my ears. Maybe I've romanticized who Jesus is. 
and somehow that response, those responses seem really unkind. They seem harsh to me. Let the dead bury their own. Oh, Jesus? No one who looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. Ooh. Wow. At the very least, Jesus avoids what Dietrich Bonhoeffer called cheap grace. We may have something to learn from that. In addition, Jesus' harshness is probably, probably also justified by the psychological phenomenon that I'm aware of, maybe you are aware of it in your life, where emotional response becomes a substitute for actual response. That is, as commentator William Barclay put it, every time we have a fine feeling and do not act upon it, it is less likely that we'll actually do it. See, Barclay gives the example then of having the impulse to write someone a sympathy note, but then life happens and it goes on. The likelihood of our actually doing that is very small. So we have the good impulse, the feel-good impulse, but not the follow-up action. I say on more than one occasion, when all is said and done, there's more said than done. So in any case, Jesus' response to these excuses or these cop-outs tells us that his disciples need to be focused on what lies ahead, not what lies behind. Since we are forgiven people, what is behind us is, well, behind us. The faithful focus of the people of God is what lies ahead. And what's more, how we live into that fact of faith says a lot about our priorities, our sense of commitment. We all know, I, I think we all know, what setting priorities and committing to them can really mean. It's an assignment of relative importance to the connections and what matters really in our life. And with the determination that no matter how much effort and energy we put into things or relationships lower on the list, we will not do anything that knocks the main thing out of that first place. Jesus was talking about deciding what the main thing is when he told his would-be disciples to put him first over whatever else was clamoring for their attention. And we as followers are eavesdropping into something very important. You see, Jesus has said this a lot of different ways a lot of other times. Look to where your treasures are. There you will find your heart. See, it's not the other way around. Oh, I have such a good heart. No, no, no. Look at your checkbook. There you will find what you really find to be important. He knew that. And then he said, but strive first for the kingdom of God, and all else will follow. We are so good at offering our but response, an excuse about why we can't possibly respond wholeheartedly, yes. It's been pointed out that bad excuses are worse than none. It is said, don't make excuses, make good. Way back in early Greek times, a proverb came, every vice has its excuse ready. I don't know if this is true, I'm suspect. I've got this hermeneutic, this interpretation of suspicion, but it says here in my notes, Benjamin Franklin said this. May or may not be true, but Benjamin Franklin is quoted as saying, he that is good for making excuses is seldom good for anything else. He who excuses himself accuses himself. Hold yourself responsible for a higher standard than anybody else expects of you. Never excuse yourself, says Henry Ward Beecher. And a Yiddish proverb reminds us, if you don't want to do something, if you really don't want to do something, one excuse is as good as another. 
So most of us are really good at offering excuses. And that is what makes it so difficult to try to apply what seems to be coming to us from this scripture today. To try to apply it to our own story, our own lives, our own challenges. We find it's not easy to translate to something concrete. We don't want to be the one that says, but. We want to be among those who say to Jesus, yeah, yeah, I will follow you now and always. But if we make that decision, what does it actually mean? See, part of the problem, as preacher Fred Craddock points out, is that when Jesus asks us to give him priority over the best, he doesn't say priority over the worst. You see, Jesus never said, choose me over the devil. Right? That's an easy one. Ah, he didn't say that. He said, choose me over family. Choose me over the best. At the same time, however, the overall message of the scripture surely is not one to eschew having a family or walking away from loved ones who count on us. No, no, no. Jesus asked us to put him first. Yes, over family. But then the remarkable thing is that as we do that, those who have done that report back that they are freed from the possession and the worship of idols, even the idol of family, and have found the dynamic that's released allows them to love even more. So the questions that I ask about how do we, how do we hear what Jesus is calling us to today, the questions that I ask of myself, I invite you to listen in, the questions that I ask of myself, what does it mean to be a follower of Jesus in today's world? I, I ask, what might it mean as we consider the ideologies and impacts, the impacts of this past week's Supreme Court rulings on access to voting and marriage equality? What would following Jesus mean? as we look at those rulings and see how they'll affect people. What might it mean to be a follower of Jesus as we contemplate the impact on our children of the recent reduction in the Supplemental Nutrition Access Program? Snap. What does it mean to our children? What does it mean as followers of Jesus to see that farm bill with that provision come into reality? Or ask why it is that one out of every two children in York County, right here, have food insecurity. What does it mean, as followers of Jesus, that one out of every six Americans will go hungry? Many of them elderly. What might it mean to the congregational debate on immigration reform if followers of Jesus spoke up? What might the conversation look like if a resolution now being debated at General Synod of the United Church of Christ in California, even as I speak, what might it mean, what might it look like if that resolution regarding divesting all of our denominational holdings in fossil fuel companies actually passed? What would that look like? as a follower of Jesus. And more locally, how might the conversations around the RSU 23 unfold if followers of Jesus took their invitation to follow him seriously? Now, I don't have your answers to that. Those are my questions that I bring based on this scripture, and it ain't easy. But that's no excuse to not engage with those tough questions. So in the story from back then to this very moment today, we are being invited to be followers of the way. Followers is a hot topic right now. 
Because you see, it's crucial to the success of bloggers and tweeters. If you write a blog or host a blog, you want to have as many followers as possible. That's why one can find so many articles online about how to increase your followership. Or if you're on Twitter, you would like to have people who are reading your posts. Facebook, slightly different because rather than followers, Facebook has friends, which usually include people you don't know. And some you perhaps have not seen since you were in high school or college. And I wonder, I wonder, suppose Jesus is also concerned about the problem of followers? Is it possible that Jesus has followers he doesn't even recognize? These would be people who think that they are being linked up with Jesus, linking to his Twitter feed, reading his blog, the Bible, is probably a good idea, but truth be told, there are people who are not really into Jesus. And Jesus is like, hey, who are you anyway? I don't know you. And following Jesus is not the same as clicking like on Jesus. It means a lot more than that. If you are one of those forgiven ones, who has heard Christ's invitation and given a, a yep, yeah. but first, if you, like me, are one of those, now is a good time to refocus. The road to which Jesus calls us, and calls us all, hasn't gotten any easier, but it is still the right way. Friends, please be seated. I give God thanks in our time of prayer for the flowers that are before us. And if you had come early, if you had come about oh, maybe 20 minutes of 10, and if you had looked on this communion table, you would have seen the sun shining in the window right on those flowers. Oh, it was very beautiful. 
And so I thank God for the Connolly family and their bringing those flowers to us. I remember all of those at least dozen people in this congregation and all those beyond this congregation that journey with cancer. It is astounding. It is a difficult journey. It is made just a little better as people are held in prayer and supported in that difficult journey. I'm also recalling all of those people, some of whom in this congregation, many of whom beyond, who are journeying toward mental health. That is to say they are in a rough place right now. So I hold those people tenderly, powerfully, along with those people who know what it is to be chained by addiction. Those people who are journeying toward wholeness also. And I hold tenderly in my heart, and I invite your holding tenderly as well. And you may remember last week we celebrated in prayer and gave God thanks for the 100 years of life of Louise Weber. Approximately three days later, she died. Surrounded by family, having been wonderfully celebrated, she decided, you know what? I'm out of here. And she went beautifully. And so I offer a different kind of prayer this time, a prayer of thanksgiving for her living, a prayer of thanksgiving for her dying, and a prayer of thanksgiving for the family that is surrounding her and now is surrounded by our prayers as well. So those are the prayers that I bring, and as I invite the diaconate to come about halfway down, I'm wondering, are there prayers that might be yours to share? Jane, if you would, with Linda, please. Bill and I ask for prayers for a very wee little fellow named Jack. And Jack was born blue, unbreath not breathing. Uh, two weeks, he's still in uh, the hospital, but in, over those two weeks, he now is breathing on his own, and he is now taking food. So nice. we're very excited. Oh, for that little life that can be held in the palm of one's hand, struggling, and now thriving. And I wasn't going to say that, but I'm glad you did. And maybe, maybe, maybe ready to come home for that journey of extraordinary grace and for God's presence in, I can't say every step of the way, but in every way that Jack is carried. We hold Jack and family in our prayers. Heather and Susan. I'd like to ask for prayers for a TA friend and colleague who has entered hospice and will leave a husband, a family, and three small sons. And her first name? Heather. Prayers for Heather. As she is in the good hands of hospice, the good news, she's in good hands, the bad news is she needs to be there. For her family, and for all those, colleagues and otherwise, that love her, we offer our prayers. No kidding. Rick? Yeah, I uh, would like to offer a prayer of celebration. Uh, 29 years ago, last night, my wife said, I do. <laughs> and you thought it was because she, you asked her to marry him. <laughs> 29 years, thank you. God bless you both for the witness and the power of that witness. Thanks be to God. All right, then. I'm wondering if there are prayers from our web community this morning. Yes, Doug, I have uh, several. One from Lori Smith, who is also praying for Heather and her family and friends as she nears the end of her life. And Carol Conley has two. One for a prayer for Kathy as her mother reaches the end of her life and that she and her mother are held in God's love as her mother transitions to the next world. And Carol wants to wish a friend a happy birthday tomorrow as he will be turning 60. 
And on a personal note, I want to uh, share joy and celebration to my sister Lisa, who will be turning 50 on Tuesday. Thanks be to God for the marvelous creation of all of those persons whose birthday we celebrate and for the journey of those who need to be surrounded, embraced, uplifted, and encouraged. Thanks be to God. My friends, in ways that make sense to you, and I don't know what that is, but however it is that prayer becomes more deep, more powerful, more centering, however that is for you, let us enter into a time of prayer together. Gracious and glorious God, majestic and merciful God, creator of heaven and earth, giver of life, conqueror of death, you who have crafted us unique in all of creation and have brought us here, woven our lives together in this body of Christ. Gracious God, we come before you in prayer. We open our hearts, we open our minds, we open our souls in ways barely able to be comprehended, we are united with one another and now with you. We are aware of that connection. Gracious God, thank you. For the joys that have been expressed, for the joys of our living, for all of those that we can name and those that we can barely name, name. Hear our prayers of thanksgiving, for we understand that all of life is gift. We understand that all of what we have been given is way beyond our deserving, and yet, and still, we are blessed. So in those times, O oh God, and there are those times, when we forget or lose track of or somehow become confused about or out of focus around our blessings, Lord God, be present to us. Grant that our journey, though it may seem dark at times, though it may seem beyond our capabilities, though our own fatigue may be great, allow in those times, O oh God, to know that you are Emmanuel. Know that you are with us every step of our journey. Allow us, O oh God, to not only know that, but to open ourselves to those prayers, those ministries of kindness from family and friends and neighbors and, yes, even strangers your face of love may be known to us and our souls may take comfort. And as we seek to follow your son Jesus in ways both strange, difficult, and challenging, gracious God, allow us the certainty of your presence, the comfort of your love, and the ability to know your will for us. Oh God, hear our prayers and guide our steps and use our lives that we may be pleasing in your sight and honoring of your Son, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. 
And lead us not into temptation, but to deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. We prepare to receive your tithes, your gifts, your offerings. We prepare to receive the signs, the symbols, the tokens of your celebration, your gratitude, your thanksgiving to God. I invite your generosity, I invite your playfulness, I invite your joy. Let us receive the offering at this time. God, thank you for these gifts. Yes, these gifts in this plate. Yes, these gifts in these pews. Yes, these gifts surrounding our entire being. Thank you, God. In the name of your Son, Jesus, we pray. Amen.
Lord's face shine upon you, be gracious unto you. And as you look around, know that you are amongst the children of God. Know that you have been blessed beyond measure. Know that you are loved in ways that transcend any difficulties you may yet have to face. So, be the good news to someone who desperately needs to hear it. Support one another. Go forth from this place knowing and being the good news of God's love. Go forth in God's peace. Mm -hmm.